Um, good afternoon, and uh, from us as well, we are the conveners of this uh, seminar. Um, George Sublis and myself, Rosa Vasilaki, thank you very much for, for coming uh, uh, and for being with us tonight in our first, uh, in our first session, uh, session of the series of Politics of Liberation. We have the honor and the pleasure to host tonight Dylan Riley. He's going to talk to us about the end of uh, democratic capitalism and the tasks of the left. We hope to have your participation and your questions. And the seminar is broadcasted uh, right as we speak online. So if you are online and you have questions, please, by all means, send them to us. Uh, and we will, we will address them as well. So Dylan, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, um, thanks to uh, both Rosa and George uh, for in inviting me. And, and thanks also to Phoebe and, and Fritz. Um, it's been uh, really wonderful to be here so far, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you, and I thank you for coming uh, to listen to me talk. So, um, without further ado, let me get into the substance of uh, my remarks today. I'm talking, obviously, about the end of capitalism and the tasks of the left. I'm not sure if it fits well into the politics of liberation theme, in a sense. It's a frankly, quite depressing set of conclusions I'm going to be reaching, but, uh, but we will see how that goes as the evening unfolds. The talk is going to be organized in terms of these six kind of headings, so I'm going to try to formulate in the first part of the talk the basic question of democratic capitalism, because uh, I think that's the starting point for understanding the crisis that we're in currently. Then I'm going to talk very briefly and perhaps for the taste of some of the people in this room somewhat superficially about dem democracy and capitalism in a kind of historical perspective. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the long slowdown in the world economy starting from around 1980. And then I'm going to talk about the implications of that for how we should think about the new political economy that is emerging, current period, and the new politics that I think is very much based on that new political economy. And finally, I'll briefly indicate what I think that implies in terms of tasks um, for the left. So the first issue for me is to try to get the question right about the capitalism and democracy relationship. It's really quite a, an important puzzle, and we need to think seriously about that before we can think about the issue of democratic crisis. So I'm going to be a little bit didactic here, but I, hopefully that will be somewhat useful. We need to figure out what we mean by these big terms of capitalism and democracy. Let's begin, of course, with capitalism. What is it? Broadly speaking, capitalism is a system in which private owners of the major means of production appropriate a surplus product that is produced by wage laborers. And the most important issue for me, about capitalism in relationship to democracy, is that the main investment decisions are made in capitalism by private owners of the means of production. Um, and that means that the surplus product is allocated according to private decisions. But that allocation, of course, has social consequences, very major ones. So capitalism for our purposes, the most important thing about it, in a sense, is this fact that the, one of the major sorts of decisions that a society can make for itself, how to invest the surplus product, and therefore the overall dynamic of economic growth, is not in the hands of any publicly controlled instance, and is particularly not determined democratically. Democracy, on the other hand, I will define in terms of the very conservative, but obviously widely regarded, uh, Austrian sociologist Josef Schumpeter, who uh, described modern democracy, in my view, quite correctly, as an institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of competitive struggle for the people's vote. This is an extraordinarily thin definition of democracy, of course, but that's actually useful in my uh, conception because what I'm going to suggest is that even this extraordinarily thin conception of democracy 
which more or less describes, as I'll say, still the modal form of political rule, at least in the advanced capitalist world, even this thin form of democracy is not at all clear that it will survive um, the fundamental transformations in the economy that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so if we know what capitalism is, let's, let's just make sure that we know also that it exists. That is to say, what does the basic evidence say about whether capitalism exists or not? And here, of course, I think we can draw on Thomas Piketty's obviously very important groundbreaking uh, work to give us a little bit of empirical sense about the extent to which we live in a capitalist world. And the most important issue, of course, for capitalism is not income inequality. It's inequality of capital ownership. This is a very important point. I'll actually be returning to this a number of times in the talk. The defining thing about capitalism is not that there is inequality of income. The defining thing about capital is that there is inequality of the basic ownership of the basic assets of the society. And the really major contribution that uh, Piketty has made, or at least one of his really major contributions, has been to focus on this dimension of inequality, inequality of capital, uh, not just inequality of income. What does he show? Well, lots of things, but here's a table that I just kind of pulled from his book. And it basically shows you inequality of capital ownership. Uh, the basic message that you get from this table is that for a brief period of time in the utopia of the Scandinavian lands, there was some slight moderation in the distribution of capital ownership in the 70s. But basically, the situation that we are living in now is, of course, an immense concentration of capital ownership among the very top um, of the people who own capital. So this is like a distribution of people who own capital. So the, the bottom 50% of basically every major capital society effectively owns nothing, 5% of, 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 of capital. That's a very important thing just to register. We live in a capitalist world. It's quite remarkable, actually, how stable the inequality uh, in this dimension um, has been. And there's something even more important to consider. Piketty's definition of capital is extraordinarily broad and loose. It just means sort of ownership of anything that might create some sort of rent, including you know, even people's um, retirement portfolios and things of that nature. But if we just define capital even a little bit more rigorously to think about the distribution of capital as a social power, that is to say, the distribution of the power to actually make major investment decisions in a society, it's undoubtedly the case that capital is far more unequally distributed than even Piketty's evidence shows. So it's a very broad, that we're, what we're looking at when we're looking at Piketty is the most, uh, indeed a wildly optimistic scenario about how egalitarian capitalism is. It's not that way, in fact. So I guess we all know that, but I thought it might be useful just to establish what we're talking about. Back again to democracy then. Now, obviously, what I'm working toward is to get you to see what an enormous paradox it is that we have this thing called democratic capitalism. For despite this massive concentration of ownership, formerly democratic mechanisms, in this very thin Schumpeterian sense, as we can occasionally kick out the political class, formerly democratic mechanisms have existed in most of the rich world and much of the non-rich world. So if you just look at the Freedom House indicators of democracy, many of you will have probably visited this website before. This is just a way of essentially um, quantifying and coding where, what parts of the world are free. Now, it's, we can talk about the ideology of Freedom House. I'm not advocating that. This is I'm just providing you some sense Basically, what the map shows is that 
if you look at the kind of OECD world, it's all democratic and not very. The problem was that the proletariat did not understand itself as a class in the advanced capitalist world because the commodity form had sunk so deeply into their consciousness that they thought of themselves as individuals acting within a system of constraints. And it was this phenomenon of the reification of class consciousness that explained why, basically, they're, you know, they're not voting, they're not acting in class ways, in the ways that we might expect. Then, of course, presumably our favorite of the classical Marxists, Rosa, her argument was quite interesting and very important. She said that the division between political struggle and economic struggle and their separation is but an artificial product of the parliamentary period. And then she went on to describe that division. The economic struggle is fractionalized and disaggregated and limited to each firm and each branch of production. On the other hand, political struggle is conducted not by masses through direct action, but in conformity with the structure of the bourgeois state. The suggestion here is that, in a way, democracy itself, that is to say, electoral formal democracy itself, poses fundamental problems for the development of class consciousness. Why so? Because politics in a bourgeois democratic society occurs as individuals going to the voting booth primarily. And individuals going to the voting booth don't form a class. And so there's a way in which for Luxembourg, the power. And what did he mean by hegemony? The fact of hegemony presupposes, he said, that account be taken of the interests and the tendencies of the groups over which hegemony is to be exercised and that a certain compromise, equilibrium, should be formed. In other words, that a leading group should make sacrifices of an economic corporate kind. Now, what Gramsci was posing here is a materialist answer to the question. This is the thing that's quite important to understand about Gramsci's understanding of hegemony across the exploitation divide. So we need to understand a little bit about what that is. Let's do that really by considering briefly democracy and capitalism in history. So there's something important to consider when approaching this topic. And I'm going very, being very rough and ready here. But I want to say the question of democracy, just this basic electoral democracy that we've been talking about, a democracy occurs in the core countries of capitalism really very late. This is a really important thing to understand. Liberal societies emerge earlier, but real democracy in the United States from around 1970, say the year before I was born. This is a late achievement. Um, and of course, the United Kingdom's slightly earlier, at, you know, Lenin may have had a point. <laughs> That's basically what we can say about that. But the basic point is that it's a late phenomenon. This is something that a book which I admire but disagree with profoundly, but on this point, Sherry Berman is quite correct in pointing out that capitalist democracy is largely a phenomenon of the post-World War II period. Now, it also had a particular content, and this gets back um, to, um, this will get back to this materialist interpretation of why it's possible to have capitalist democracy in a minute. But let's draw out the implications first of the historical observation that democracy is late, surprisingly late. It suggests in a way that Marx's initial intuition that there was some kind of very profound tension between capitalism and democracy was quite correct. It turned out, in fact, that it was extraordinarily difficult to combine capitalism and democracy, and that was particularly true as capitalism entered into its, you know, kind of monopolistic phase associated with the second industrial revolution, so electricity, petroleum products, 
and large integrated firms. This phase of industrialization was very, very hard to combine with democracy and created real problems of democracy everywhere. And so there was something, there was an intuition that Marx had that was right. So now let's try to figure out if we can flesh out what the actual material basis of and services in part would have expanded because part of the societal product had been withheld in the past from the immediate producers. That is to say, it was in fact in the material interest of the working class to support accumulation because accumulation meant growth, meant jobs. There was a truth to, to capitalism that a rising tide lifts all boats. And capitalism, historically, is an utterly distinctive structure of exploitation precisely in this sense. Capitalism is really the only structure of exploitation that has delivered anything like economic growth. There is no other, and this is Gramsci's great insight, of course, there is no other ruling class that can exercise hegemony in this sense, right? The feudal lord does not provide growth. The feudal lord steals from the direct producer, basically. And, you know, this is basically true of all previous dominant classes. Only the capitalist class has this at least potential to construct a hegemony. And that is the material basis of, the, of democracy. But this is a tricky thing to construct, even under capitalism, even if it is potentially possible to create such a class compromise, it is very hard to actually do it. And the reason is because in order to really get a capitalist democracy working, you had not only to have this mm, particular structure of production based on investment and competition which generates growth, you also have to have a working class that is powerful enough to elicit concessions from capital but is not so powerful that it threatens capitalist fundamental interest in maintaining that monopoly over the system of, of production, over private property and the means of production. So it's a very delicate balance, right, that you're trying to strike, right? How was that balance struck? Well, it took a long time, especially on the European continent, and this is not something that I need to tell this audience, <laughs> presumably. Um, you could say, in light of this, that interwar fascism, of course, arises precisely in a situation in which the working class is too strong. It, in fact, did, particularly in Italy and Germany, did threaten the basic ownership interests of, of, of capital. So the historical function of fascism in this kind of point of view was precisely to discipline workers and the left so that they would not overreach the bounds of uh, legitimate politics. Uh, a similar process we could say played out in Latin America. Um, and here I just want to reference one of the most important things I think ever written about Latin American politics. It was an essay by Perry Anderson written in 1988 where he puts the point, capitalist democracy was constructed on the defeat and not on the victory of the popular classes. That is to say, the right-wing dictatorships of the 60s and 70s in Latin America laid the foundations for subsequent democratization in Latin America, just as the fascist dictatorships in Europe had done the same thing. And capitalism is not delivering the goods. It is not a, it is not a particularly dynamic economic system. Now, this might strike some of you as very surprising or maybe obvious, I'm not sure, um, but that's kind of what the consensus is that is emerging among economic historians of very widely different political and theoretical perspectives at this point. Let's go back to Piketty just for a second. Um, this is just evidence on per capita output growth um, over, you know, an annual average growth rates over uh, selected periods. If we look at Europe, um, which is, uh, this is where the pattern is most striking, of course, it's just very important to understand that the 1950 to 1970 period, or what is called, obviously, the 30 glorious years, is completely distinctive. 
And this is also, of course, precisely the period where we get the consolidation of capitalist democracy, right? So you really do have uh, a rising uh, tide lifting all boats in that period. You, can, you see that the, the U.S. growth pattern is slightly smoother, um, but the same basic pattern is uh, evident there. The immediate post-war period is the period of growth. The subsequent period has not been particularly impressive at all. Here's another way of considering what's been happening. And this is from a recent article by Cedric Durand in the New Left Review, an article which is, I think, a very convincing riposte to a, um, a critic of his work. Um, basically, uh, what Durand shows here is this really striking, I mean, collapse of fixed investment, right, uh, as a share of GDP in the OECD countries over the last 50 years or so. Um, those cycles are basically, you know, business cycles. But the overall trend is downward. Uh, and that's very important because, of course, what fixed investment is, it's precisely that process by which capitalists are expanding the pie. And it is precisely that which is creating the possibility for class compromise in our materialist interpretation of why capitalist democracy is possible. And here, just a, a final thing to kind of uh, look at. I think this is a quite striking graph. This is from a very conservative man, Andrew Smithers, from a, a journal that, um, it's a very strange journal called American Affairs, which um, I would say it basically is, a, it's a kind of intellectual justification of Trumpism. But because it is, it, 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 it sometimes uh, attracts very heterodox and independent-minded thinkers Smithers being one of them. Smithers' graph here, which is taken, as you can see, from the US Federal Reserve and Bureau of Economic Analysis, what it shows is this kind of X pattern of collapsing investment and rising cash distributed to shareholders. That's the dotted line. That's cash going to shareholders. And the solid line is investment, right? This is a very important graph and tells, tells us something very important about the structure of the emerging economy. This is from an economic historian who is basically, you know, probably the premier student of the pattern of growth in the U.S. over the last century, Robert Gordon. And it shows um, rates of labor productivity growth over some selected years. The message here is extremely clear. It, from the 1891 to 1972 period, U.S. labor productivity grew rapidly. Um, it then fell off a cliff after the early 1970s, briefly recovered. This is basically cell phones or something, and is now again off a cliff. Now, Robert Gordon became famous for the following observation, which I think is quite revealing. He said, imagine that you are in your kitchen and you have a choice. You can either have all the technology that has been invented since 2000, but none of the technology that has, was invented over the previous 100 years, or you can have all the technology that came over the subsequent period. It just hasn't been the case at all. Um, we probably could all do quite nicely and live very nice first world existences if we had never seen a cell phone. And I wouldn't mind if email went away forever, actually, which may be the case for many of you as well. So what does this mean? Well, here, I think it's, it's really Robert Brenner who has drawn the, the conclusions to this, particularly in a piece that he wrote in 2017 called Introducing Catalyst. In Catalyst magazine, I would recommend that people go look at that. His summary is basically this. The decline in the profit rate, he sees the decline in the profit rate as a result of basically overcapacity and competition among the major blocks of the capitalist world has led to a fall in surpluses available to corporations while worsening the prospects to invest them. And the result has been a historic weakening of capital accumulation. 
The reduction in the rate of return has also provoked an ongoing assault on workers' wages, benefits, and working conditions, which, by redistributing income upward from labor to capital, has subsidized profits and prevented an even greater decline of profitability. But this combination of weak investment and falling wages has made for an ongoing worsening crisis of aggregate demand, because if you're squeezing your workers, who's going to buy your stuff? which is the immediate cause of the long slowdown and hangs like a dark cloud of the global economy. Put another way, the very processes by which the profit rate has been stabilized prevented that stabilization from increasing the economy's uh, vitality, right? So the, the, the world of capitalist economy is in, to some extent or to, to a very great extent experiencing a historic and long-term slowdown in profitability and in rates of investment. And this is creating, and the responses on the part of capital to the slowdown tend to exacerbate the problem. They do not get capital out of it. Because what they do is they undermine the markets, basically, um, for uh, capital's uh, goods. So that raises, obviously, a super important issue, kind of in light of where we have been in this little tour of capitalism and democracy. If capitalist growth is slowing in the way that I've described, and if that growth had been, in fact, the basis of democracy in the post-World War II period, what are the consequences of that decline in economic dynamism for the politics of capitalist society? What, in particular, is to become of democracy once its material base has been so eroded? That is the question that I think we have to face. Um, so let me shift gears a little bit here and try to conceptualize and to provide maybe just a little bit of description about the fundamental pattern of the new economy. And I want to give that pattern of the new economy a term. And I'm going to call it um, political capitalism because I think that's the phase that um, we are entering. Just a few things to keep in mind here. One of the characteristics of contemporary capitalism is this huge savings glut that is kind of sloshing around um, uh, the world economy. And that savings glut is, of course, just the other side of what Brenner termed in that previous quote, a historic weakening of capital accumulation. It just isn't an obvious place for a lot of this profit to go. Where are you going to invest it? What has happened, of course, and here I'm drawing on uh, Janos Varoufakis' term recycling the surplus, right? What has happened is that the state, in a broad sense, has stepped in in a more and more active role to guarantee rates of return in a whole variety um, of different ways. We can think about this in first with the US Federal Reserve and the so-called Volcker shock in 1980. Um, what that showed was basically a way of using interest rate policies to suck savings out of the world economy, bring them into the US, undermine the power of labor, and destroy prospects for development in both Latin America and ultimately to basically unravel the Eastern Bloc, right? This was a deeply political decision uh, that was very much related to sagging rates of return and overcompetition in the world economy. Um, there's, in, in a way, the European debt crisis of 2010 is just a manifestation of this same issue. Surpluses were first recycled into private debt that then became public debt as the cost of the underlying economic problem lack of investment outlets, again, were shifted onto wage earners, especially in the European periphery. I don't really need to speak about that here, as you all are very well aware of this issue. The point about these things that I want to uh, just underline is that they're highly political. So the responses to this crisis in profitability of the world economy has been a talk about under this new uh, kind of structure of political capitalism. Um, we can think about, in one sense, the 2007-2008 uh, 
financial crisis, or particularly the response to that, right? I mean, the cause of that crisis, let's remember, is the subprime mortgage to come in and bail them out, which is in fact what happened. It was an entirely political move. The profitability of these things depended upon the relationship between the banks and the state. The crisis ended with this unbelievable thing, the Troubled Asset um, uh, Relief Program, which handed out billions of dollars to banks who were bankrupt and still paying massive bonuses to their executives. This had nothing to do with competition on an open market, producing goods, uh, and competing on price. This had to do with relationships between banks and the state, and obviously naked political power. Uh, and obviously, the same thing is true uh, of the European debt crisis. It's been widely documented. These decisions were completely political. Um, and so again, it was rescue, um, the, uh, rescue the banks uh, on the backs of uh, wage earners and, and taxpayers. Now that's a new structure. It is a new political economy. That's what I'm suggesting. And it's here, I believe, to stay at least as long as no alternative system of accumulation emerges. The term political capitalism that I'm drawing on actually comes from the great German sociologist, Max Weber, who, it's a little odd to talk about Weber in the Rosa Luxemburg Institute, uh, but please excuse me, he's still kind of useful in certain respects. Which Weber says, is not based on the peaceful provision of wants. Rather, it is based on the use of political power to squeeze the underlying population. Among its more his important historical forms have been tax farming and state debt. Um, and my suggestion, or my basic thesis, is that we are living through a transition in the capitalist economy toward a form of capitalism which more resembles political capitalism than it resembles the capitalism of the post-war period which was based on basically productivity what Marxists call relative surplus value and a rising tide uh, lifting all boats. And that transition to political capitalism, I would suggest further, is going to have fundamental consequences for the forms of social stratification, for the fundamental dynamic, and for the political regimes of the advanced capitalist world and the not so advanced capitalist world. So if that's the sort of that's kind of the underlying you know, infrastructure that I want to lay out. This is the transformation of capitalism that we are living through. So then, what kind of politics is coming out of this transformation? Part of the social surplus in means of production and therefore expand output, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But if capital is not doing that, Capital cannot be hegemonic in that way. And in fact, there is, I think, very clearly a crisis of hegemony. And I think that crisis of hegemony has been evident since 2008, if not before, and has not been in any way uh, resolved. But here's the rub, especially for those of us who are interested in a better society, is that the agent of transformation has, by the same process, also been organizationally decimated. That is to say, the working class. So we have, you know, particularly, um, obviously, in Anglo-American context, but really everywhere, we have a working class which is increasingly fragmented, which is increasingly delinked from its historical vehicles of political expression, particularly the social democratic parties, which are all in crisis. Um, and uh, is pulverized and individualized. So there's a paradoxical thing that's going on, which is that there is a crisis of hegemony, and yet there's no agent that could resolve that crisis. At least there is none that is immediately obvious on the horizon. And the reason for that is that the very nature of the crisis of hegemony has in fact undermined the agent that could resolve it. 
This is not a very optimistic scenario. The final feature of the contemporary period is a delegitimization of the state. And this, too, is a result of the political capitalism. Because if the state is, in fact, very obviously an executive committee of the bourgeoisie, one might think that that would play to the benefit of the left. But here's the paradox. There is something that I've called in other contexts the kind of Marxism of the man in the street, excuse the sexist language, that basically says they're all corrupt. It's all about money. That never plays well for the left. Because what that means is I don't want to pay taxes. Right? And that is basically what is happening. Right? That is, there is a delegitimization of the state at the same time as um, there is a crisis of capitalist hegemony. So it's a paradoxical situation that we are in that has these three features. Now, that has really important consequences for the structure of political conflict in contemporary capitalist societies that I think we should really consider a bit. During the 30 glorious years, we could say, class conflicts took the form of a hegemonic struggle, which means, I think, most concretely, that it was never just a struggle over distribution, actually. It was also a struggle over the control of society's surplus. That is to say, at least in its most ambitious forms, social democracy had the idea of intervening and politicizing and particularly democratizing investment decisions. The Meidner plan could be the kind of high watermark in that regard. As Shavorsky says again, while in the early stages of the development of capital labor relations, the conflict focused on the right to struggle for wage increases, the essential feature of social democratic Keynesian compromise has been the attention of the working class to the actual investment out of profits. I think this puts to lie, the lie to a certain extent to a kind of notion of Keynesian social democratic politics as exclusively focused on issues of distribution. They were primarily, but not exclusively. There was always within classic European social democracy the idea of something that would go beyond that, the idea of actual democratic control over investment decisions. Of course, it never amounted to anything, but it was there. So that was the, there was a kind of struggle on this terrain, right? Who's going to control the social surplus? In the contemporary period, struggle has not that pattern at all. It is a struggle that I think Piketty captures well in describing it as a logic of rights. It's fundamentally not a struggle over the control of the social surplus. It's a struggle that is focused, and here I'm speaking, of course, as an American, but I think this has broader applicability. It is a struggle that is focused fundamentally on inequalities and which uses the rhetoric of justice and injustice. And it is a struggle between those who are either seeking to justify inequalities through various claims to merit, which are more or less meritless, you could say, or to address, redress inequalities by claiming that they are in some way illegitimate. This form of struggle itself, in my opinion, is a major problem for uh, the left because it is fundamentally a redistributive struggle. It is not a hegemonic struggle. It is fundamentally focused on redistributing a fixed pie and is not offering a new model of accumulation of any sort. In fact, I think that there's lots of people, at least in my country, who believe that socialism is defined by a commitment to redistribution, which in my opinion is completely inadequate. Not to say absolutely wrong, but deeply inadequate as, a, as an articulation of the idea. Now, there's another thing that's going on kind of sociologically, which I think is quite important. 
Well, first let me just, um, before I get into that, I've already referenced the notion of status groups, but I'm going to return to that because I think this is another Weberian idea that's very useful for us in this context. Let's just sort of organize our thinking. We can contrast a hegemonic struggle versus a redistributive struggle in, in these three ways, right? Hegemonic struggle was future-oriented. Redistributive struggle is past-oriented, right? You can see it in the language of the contemporary left, which is focused on justice. But justice is something that you get to redress a wrong and happens after the fact, right? Socialism is a project for a new structure of accumulation and looks forward. Hegemonic struggle is inherently universalistic. Redistributive struggle is inherently particularistic. That means hegemonic struggle is about creating a new society in which human flourishing is possible. Redistributive struggle is basically about who gets what and what's fair. Right? It's no accident that John Rawls is the theorist of the hour. Hegemonic struggle is totalizing. Right? It is not about looking at one group in relation to other groups. It has to do with the society, nature of society as a whole. Redistributive struggle is atomizing. It requires no particular vision of society at all. It requires only a commitment to fairness, a commitment to justice. So what's happening sociologically, I guess that's kind of a pretentious expression, but I am a sociologist, so I guess I can sneak it in. What's happening is that class conflict is transforming, right? For Marx, remember, class conflict, as I've said already, is not about a conflict over redistribution. It's about a conflict over the control of the social surplus. That is to say, it's a conflict which is oriented to transforming the fundamental developmental dynamic of society. The Brazilian scholar Armando Boito has formulated the contrast with the terminology of class struggle rather than class conflict. So one can have class conflict focused on redistribution all one wants. That's not really distinctively Marxian or socialist. Class struggle happens when the question is about control over the social surplus. What's happened, I'm saying, is there's obviously been a kind of a transition toward redistribution. The sociological component of this is that redistributive struggles also have a marked tendency to be culturalized. That is to say, they have a tendency to emerge as struggles among what Max Weber, again, called status groups. And we can see this on the contemporary left in particular. There is a rise of identity-based forms of struggle. Of course, obviously on the right, too, right? So uh, mobilizing around race, ethnicity, gender, which is something that the right engages in much more effectively in many ways than does the left. The point about this new form of conflict, why does it emerge? It has a material basis. And that material basis has to do with the nature of the underlying economic conflict, which is redistributional, not hegemonic. We have class conflict, but no class struggle. And what is the form that classes take when class struggle is no longer possible? It is what we think about as identity-based forms of conflict, or what Weber would have called status conflicts. And so you have a proliferation of these forms of conflict, and these things, by the way, have a real material basis. That is to say, it's not at all just a matter of false consciousness. People are trying to defend their own in a very hostile world. That's what's happening. Um, so it's quite understandable that these forms of conflict um, would emerge. And um, it is not at all a matter of culture versus the economy. There is a material basis to these forms of politics. 
Uh, we can be even more sort of explicit about that, again, drawing on some of Piketty's stuff, particularly his, I guess it's his second, like, thousand-page tome or whatever, this, uh, where he identifies these two new, he identifies this, I think says something very important about the structure of conflict in advanced capitalist societies. We have, basically, a Brahmin left that sort of believes in an ideology of education, educational meritocracy, we have a what he calls a proprietarian right uh, that justifies property ownership as the basis of inequality. There's lots of conflict uh, among these groups. Outside of them, we have people who are basically excluded from the political system. My kind of interpretation of this new form of, of, of conflict, which has taken completely, I think, in my own country, has displaced almost entirely the older forms of class conflict, these are basically conflicts about rents. They're fiscal conflicts, they're redistributive conflicts, however you want to think about that. That's kind of the texture of politics in the period of political capitalism. Okay. So let me just pull together um, what I've said in a kind of, you know, model. I guess this is, this is, being, this is, this is kind of an obsession of sociology to have little diagrams and models. I have one too. Um, Obviously, I'm beginning with this idea that there is a crisis of profitability and a crisis of accumulation. But that has generated a turn toward political mechanisms. Um, that is to say, that has generated um, what we think about broadly actually as neoliberalism, which is kind of interesting because, of course, neoliberalism praises the market, but in fact, in action, it is, a, it is, a, it is the use of political power for the redistributing things. Those strategies do not solve the underlying problem. In fact, they exacerbate it. So there is an interaction between the turn toward political mechanisms and the crisis of profitability. The crisis of profitability weakens the working class. The working class being weak also exacerbates the crisis of profitability. The turn toward political mechanisms further weakens the working class. So there is a really, there is a vicious circle on, on this, what I guess for you, is the left-hand side of this diagram. That is leading to the rise of status group politics, which is further weakening the working class. And all these things together are producing what I think is a profound structural crisis, not a conjunctural, um, occasional crisis of capitalist democracy that is rooted in this new economy, in the rise of political capitalism. Okay. So let me just briefly talk. I'm, I don't have too much to say in this last part, which is kind of disappointing. Uh, but let me just see if I can sort of raise, you know, what the tasks of the left might be in this kind of environment. The basic problem of the contemporary left, in my opinion, is its focus on the problem of redistribution. And that's true at least of the sort of center lefts. Think again about Piketty's policy recommendations. It's a global tax on capital. Okay. And as I've already said, there's no model of accumulation that is being proposed here. It's essentially about um, redistributing uh, a very admittedly extremely unequal gains. There are two problems with focusing on redistribution are focusing exclusively on redistribution. The first is that redistributive policies do not address the underlying problem of how to grow the economy. It's unclear how they would solve the structural problem of underinvestment. The second problem, which is more political, is that they're not popular because people don't like to be taxed. And they particularly don't like to be taxed, as I had said before, in the context of a state that has lost its legitimacy because of its imbrication with political capitalism. Right? So the very things that are undermining the legitimacy of capitalism are also undermining the state. And unfortunately, the left, or at least the Anglo-American left, has hitched its wagon entirely to the state and conceives of the state as the answer actually, to many, many political questions, but it cannot be. So the only thing that I can say is that it strikes me 
that the left must move from a politics of redistribution to a politics of accumulation. It's essential to somehow reflate hegemonic politics that are axed on democratic control over investment, not political intervention post-production. That is the only thing that can save democracy as a form of political life. Thank you. Or to put it differently, uh, the accumulation of public money yeah. during uh, the Trente Glorieuse, the glorious 30 years, that was the basis of the, of the, uh, of the welfare state. Uh, is this the material basis of this uh, mutation, of this transformation uh, of, uh, of these capitalists where uh, economic elites uh, are doing a risalto to public money? which is a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. not only the, the exploitation of the working class traditionally in the, in the factories. In, in, I mean, if I'm thinking about my own country, to the extent that it has a welfare state, but it does, it more, more actually than I think some Europeans understand, there's a lot of state in the American economy, and in and, and particular, think about um, the healthcare industry. Um, which, so there was a, the program that I guess it, it begins in the Great Society programs of the 1960s, Medicare, um, is a, basically a mechanism that transfers a ton of public money into American healthcare and um, has become exactly what you're saying, <laughs> basically a source of profits for uh, private healthcare providers. The same thing is true of the two, and more crucially in a way, the same thing is true of the, of the large um, government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are basically public-private entities that um, were set up during the New Deal to provide cheap loans and kind of create the American su suburb. Um, and these two, these were at the center of the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, these two um, have been turned essentially in the direction of political capitalism. So I think my answer is that I, I think that you're onto something very important actually, um, that somehow the build out of the welfare state infrastructure created certain opportunities to turn this in a, in a different direction. That is to say the 19th century liberal state would not have offered such purchase to um, capitalists. So that's, I think that's a great point. Thank you for it, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for this. This was really inspiring, really thought provoking. Um, I, I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is perhaps if you could um, elaborate a little bit more um, on the form that uh, politics of um, uh, investment or accumulation would take because the way I, I tr I'm trying to figure this out is that I find it difficult to see how a politics of like looking at investment or accumulation doesn't fall prey to some logic of redistribution of resources. So the difference between these two um, to my mind, I, it's not very clear to me, so perhaps you could um, speak a little bit to that. And the second question concerns the role of like, the global system and, uh, and the role of, um, for example, a different kind of state that does uh, get involved in investment. And I'm thinking in particular the investment of China uh, into Africa and the digital Silk Road. And, um, and the ways in which Europe and America are thinking, well, maybe this is something we should be uh, involved in, so there is a kind of like a global power struggle uh, in these terms as well that I think shapes and influences the whole kind of um, landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Could you tell me your name? It's Eugenia, it's your Eugenia. parent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, thank you for those questions. Um, they're both, um, they're very acute. Um, so, Maybe, and I don't think that it's, and, and fairness and kind of um, a, a conception of equality that um, does not 
necessary decisions on the basis of democratic input. Uh, how uh, do we think about growth in, in some kind of fundamentally new way? That's the, I mean, I'm not saying no one is doing that. Some people are. But the overwhelming discussion is, you know, um, income inequality and the 1% and, and things are unfair, which is a great starting point, but it's not going to, it's not going to answer the really fundamental questions. So that's what I'm trying to say about contrasting those two things. But I do take your point. Um, and what I would say is there must be a redistribution of social power over the surplus. That's the key thing for me. The second thing that you raised, I think what I would, I'm just going to say that for me, China is an exception. <laughs> like it's, it, 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 it at least now, it is not in a political capitalist phase, which is super paradoxical. So the only country that is really operating according to the old capitalist logic is, of course, run by a communist party, which I find quite fascinating and delicious in certain kinds of ways. Um, but that's, that's the situation. Um, and, you know, how much longer that will last, we'll see, because the Chinese, too, of course, are, are facing a very inclement um, world environment. But yes, they are um, developing. Um, they're investing in Africa and, um, of course, the, the big uh, road project through Central Asia. Um, so in some ways, China is acting much more like a standard sort of hegemonic capitalist state than the uh, sort of supposed liberal democracies, whatever remains of them in the advanced world. Of course, they don't have democracy, or at least they don't have class compromise that is actually more robust than, than, than what happens in the West. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Very interesting, uh, powerful talk. Uh, actually, I agree with all what you said. But my role here is to challenge you. Okay. Okay. And democracy. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say, of course, we know the Schumpeterian, um, let's say, uh, definition of the term, and you use it. But this is a very conservative way to discuss about democracy. But what is your idea about democracy? Because actually, you are trying to tell us to convince us that we can find out another way to go to a more democratic uh, uh, way of of living together. But how you can imagine that? Because if, it, if the, 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 the challenge is to go to something like Schumpeter tell us, that is the best way to have democracy, I'm not sure that is enough to go with you in this new struggle, let's say. So how you can configure that? And the second question is, OK, of course, uh, the fall of investment is the big thing since the 80s. But there is a lot of money. Where is this money? We have accumulation, but this accumulation is out of the economic and political system. And that's why the, uh, this uh, very interesting uh, new way to explain problems uh, through uh, political capitalism is, is uh, convincing. But let's think, where is all this money? So I think that this is something that is missing in, in your um, description of the problem is uh, the importance of uh, a shadow capitalism, of course, financial capitalism, and now the digital capitalism, because you have a, 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 new, a new area of accumulation that is out of any control. And all these guys, the GAFAM leaders, are libertarians. For mm -hmm. them, the state has no uh, reason to exist. Okay, it's not that it's about delegitimization or all these things. It's even worse. So how uh, this class struggle could, could take place in a society where the accumulation is immaterial and is also, uh, uh, it, it's also um, uh, produced with the prospect to exist in the future? Because this is, for example, the, the non-fungible token. You know this, the NFTs. This is, this is exactly the game there. And there is a lot of money that is it's a kind of, 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 uh, of, of new way to accumulate money with nothing mm -hmm. almost so I don't know if it's clear yeah, yeah it's clear Thanks. <laughs> very clear thank you for those questions um, so uh, yeah you know I I don't I feel a little odd 
uh, speaking on democracy in this context. But what I would say is that um, in this talk, I was, I was consciously adopting a quite conservative, very thin conception of democracy because I think even that is quite a bit in danger, right? Just this basic procedural notion. Yes, of course, the, the issue with democracy is, ex, is extremely difficult for the social sciences to deal with. And the reason is um, that um, it is what I think, there's, who's this guy? I, you, you guys will remember the reference, this notion of an essentially contested concept. Democracy is an essentially contested concept. It cannot be neutralized. <laughs> there will always be conflict about what it is, and that conflict about what it is is part of what it is. This is a strange feature um, uh, about democracy. Um, political science has for decades tried in vain to neutralize the concept, but it cannot, even the Schumpeterian concept is of course, I mean, you read Schumpeter and at the end of the book you ask yourself, why on earth are you calling this democracy? Which is a completely legitimate question, right? Um, I believe, my deepest belief is that the d democracy is incompatible with the modern state. <laughs> So in this sense, I guess, I'm, in that way, I'm a Leninist, but also kind of a Weberian, I think, because I think Weber thought this too in a weird kind of way. So um, that's my belief. I believe that a, a, truly, a, a society in which was truly politically self-determining would not have anything like the state in, the, in its modern form. I think we would have to transcend that. So in that sense, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, with Marx of the Civil War in France on that particular issue. On the issue of financial capitalism and digital capitalism, my basic view of this, my basic view is that there's a lot of hype about this stuff. I think that financialization is mostly a response to this problem of um, basically a problem of sagging returns in the manufacturing sector in the real economy. Um, I actually think there's a problem of profitability in the financial sector as well. There's a lot of money, but it's also very difficult for people to find um, adequate returns. And one, one indicator of that is, of course, precisely the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Why were all these people so eager to give out bad loans? Because there was no obvious place to invest the money, right? So this is mostly, mostly a bubble. It is not, I don't think it's a new form of accumulation, actually. I think it's essentially um, a manifestation of past accumulation and recycling of these things through the financial system um, and people are making stupendous amounts of money, but there's also this underlying problem. Like, why would it be, you, would, you just wouldn't get these phenomena that are so clearly happening in the world economy where people are making terrible loans. Like, that, that must indicate, to my mind, that there's a problem of returns in the financial sector as well. But I mean, I know this is a complicated thing. On the issue of digital capitalism, like Bitcoin and things like that. Um, I, I'm, I have to confess, I have tried to understand what the hell this is and uh, no one, I, I, I'm not sure, right? And it, it strikes me as not a form of accumulation. Um, I'm sure that some people deeply believe that it is but until I see some more evidence of it, I, and someone can explain it in, in, in a straightforward way, I'm gonna be skeptical of it. I'm sorry, that's probably a very kind of know-nothing answer, but that's basically <laughs> what my answer to that is. Yeah. Uh, my name's Helena Sheehan. Helena. Um, mm. I, I found your talk really interesting, and there's a lot there to think about, um, about the transformation of capitalism over this period. But I feel very dissatisfied with your basic conceptualization. Um, 
in terms of a transformation from democratic capitalism to what you call political capitalism. Because, well, I mean, as, as you yourself have said and other people have all sorts of a conceptualization of it uh, as being a transition from uh, democratic capitalism to political capitalism. I just can't kind of accept that. It, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't capture it. I think you need something sharper. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, well, thanks for that. Let me just say, first of all, on my conception of democracy, I'm not endorsing this. Um, I'm using it as a methodological device. That is to say, what I'm saying is that even on this very thin conception, even this very thin conception is under attack it's not at all clear. I mean, if only we had Schumpeterian democracy in a healthy and thriving state, we'd be in a better place. I'm not saying, as, as, you, as you, you said, I'm not saying that this is democracy. The reason I think it's important to adopt something like that definition, at least for heuristic purposes, is because otherwise it becomes hard to even engage in the debate, basically. And it becomes hard to even, then, then it's like, okay, so, so does it matter at all that even these thin forms of Schumpeterian democracy are withering? I think it does, actually. And I think that we should recognize that and try to understand, um, understand that. But I want to just be super clear, um, you know, I find Schumpeter fascinating and very inadequate in probably many of the ways that, that, that you do as well. Um, on the issue of capitalism has always been political. Um, so I agree in a certain way, but I think that um, there's a danger in what you're saying, which is actually to flatten out its historical periods. I don't think it's, I don't think it, I think we do need to recognize that in its, you know, in the 30 glorious years, basically, that, that, that capitalism was an amazingly dynamic system and that it did, in fact, provide things to, the, to wage earners that really no other system of exploitation in history has provided. And that's a qualitatively <laughs> distinct period. And it, it, it does have to do with capitalism. Like, I don't think that it's the welfare state uh, that did all that. Um, I think it was basically um, investment in um, goods and in, in technologies uh, by capitalists who were competing with one another in competitive markets on the prices of their products. I think that did produce stupendous economic growth. And I think we're in a new period here. So I'm, I mean, I'm totally fine if you want me to have a different language. I mean, of course, I'm, I'll defend my idea to the hill, of course, actually. But if you, but I, but I think whatever, if you don't like my um, periodization of it, then I think it is incumbent upon us as a group, maybe, to figure out what is going on. How do we periodize it? Because it's not the same thing. It's not like capitalism is always the same thing. So we need a way of periodizing it. And we need to think seriously about the history of capitalism and the, you know, the way it unfolds. So that's all, that's my plea for, you know. Uh, I am Kostas Kanelopoulos, and thank you very much for your uh, very nice uh, speech and uh, it's very good presentation. I have some objections. Uh, one of, one of uh, the first one is about hegemony. And uh, I'm not quite sure that, uh, okay, I know that this is a reading of Gramsci, of course, but I'm not quite sure that hegemony uh, only rests on uh, growth rates plus uh, a strong but disciplined working class. I think hegemony is always based on repression as well. We cannot uh, forget that. Even, even Gramsci at the end paid, uh, paid the price uh, himself. 
Uh, and I think this is uh, very important. Uh, the second objection is about uh, this concept of uh, this analysis of Robert Brenner. Uh, I don't think that it's only uh, a matter of uh, fa failing rate of uh, profitability. Uh, I think it's basic what is going on. Basically, it's a, a crisis of overaccumulation. Uh, okay, I know that these two are not incompatible, but uh, still, I think uh, we have to pay more ap attention on uh, this crisis of overaccumulation. And, uh, and a question, more or less, at the end, uh, okay, uh, I agree, it's, uh, the, ta the task for the left is not to, uh, to focus on distribution, redistribution, I think, it's okay, and I agree with you, it's uh, deeply inadequate. But if it is to turn on uh, on issues of accumulation, that means that we have to control the means of repression, the state, and actually the capital state. Thank you. Great. Thanks for those. Um, so first of all, on let, let me, I didn't, I, I've thought a bit about hegemony. Um, so let me try to respond in a couple of different ways to that question. I think that um, I think, it, of course, you're right that hegemony is not just about growth. Um, I believe that when you really think about what Gramsci was up to, he thought, in a sense, that hegemony was historically specific in different modes of production, basically, if you want to think about it in these Marxist terms. So every ruling class has a certain potential to be hegemonic or not. And then the details of whether they reach that potential or don't Here's are sort of, <laughs> that, that's digital capitalism, I guess. <laughs> um, the, the, the details of that are basically determined by political contingencies. So one of the things that people don't think about enough about Gramsci is that the only time where he seriously does an analysis of hegemony is when he's trying to explain its failure in the Italian case. And like that fail, I'm not quite sure what the theory there is, but there's a lot of things that happened to make it such that the Italian bourgeoisie couldn't be hegemonic, despite in some abstract sense, the possibility of any bourgeoisie being hegemonic because of the nature of capitalism as a system of production. So there's a certain con political contingency built into hegemony concept. And of course, it depends on what mode of production you're talking about, but that we can leave aside. Your point about repression is absolutely correct, but I don't think we disagree, actually. If you think about what I said about the f fascism, right, my point was exactly, I mean, this point about disciplined working class is exactly your point. It's the other side of your point about repression, in a sense, right? What I'm saying is that, yeah, in fact, um, the hegemonic orders of the post-World War II period were in fact based on this prior phase of highly repressive politics that limited in some ways the political spectrum and made, made it possible to have, uh, to sort of square the circle of capitalism and democracy. So I'm not sure we disagree there. On, on, on Brenner, I'm really borrowing uh, uh, obviously his basic framework for um, the uh, analysis of the fall of profitability uh, that he's laid out in several books. Um, is it, a, I mean, in one sense for what I'm saying here in terms of the underlying crisis of democracy, I don't really care whether it's a crisis of overaccumulation or whether it's a crisis of um, excess capacity. I'm not sure, like sometimes I don't, I, mean, I know people get very excited about these things. Um, I'm not sure I will want to enter that debate. I kind of want to say <laughs> there's a lot of people who are saying this, and these are not, not just Brenner and three Marxists, but also slews of mainstream economists, including Larry Summers now, who talks about secular stagnation. Everybody is saying that we're in this period of deep stagnation. So the, my starting point is basically that that's whatever the precise mechanisms of it, I tend, to, I tend to think that Brenner's analysis is the most convincing, but I'd really have to make the case for that, and I think it would be better if he made the case for that. 
Um, but I tend to sort of say that that's, that that's fine. Whatever the case is, there's a crisis of profitability and um, it has roots, it has roots in something going on in the real economy. I, that's, I take that. Um, yeah, the, does the, do we need to uh, deal with the state? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is after all, the country of Nikos Polansas. So, you know, I, I appreciate that point and I agree with it. Uh, the, uh, the state, and, and, and this, is, this is kind of, maybe it wasn't explicit enough in this talk, but um, one of the things about, um, one of the characteristics again of the, I would say the American left in particular, is a utterly uncritical attitude toward the state. The conception of the state, I mean, it's essentially a Kautskian conception. I mean, I don't use that terminology, but the state is basically a tool that we can use to, you know, pursue our various policies. This is completely wrong. And it's, it's becoming more and more wrong <laughs> as we enter into the era of political capitalism. So that's, I think, really important. So thank you for those comments. Thank you also for your fascinating discussion and um, the only thing from what you said which was extremely interesting but uh, I missed a point that we are speaking also for a patriarchal capitalism what it means that from the origins of modernity you had the discourse actually that uh, there is no class struggle that is by nature that uh, humankind uh, uh, exists a superior and inferior life we saw, I mean, we have the work of Federici that uh, show us actually how this discourse emerged in the 16th century, how actually in a new crisis of capitalism and was not forget it in the 19th century, how this emerged actually with hegemonism in the interwar years. You are absolutely right when you say that after this all occurred after 1950s, this democracy that we claim with all this franchise. But actually at this time you had also the invention of gender that means actually that you have a new sexist discourse it was actually was saying what? That there is an internal enemy, that they were the left people, that they were the sex workers, that people, some people suffer from mental illness. And uh, I think it's very important because you are absolutely right when you say we need to think seriously for the history of capitalism. And I think if we need to, uh, to think seriously, we have to put this on the table because in our days comes again that uh, capitalism goes very well and the process things. So in order to give us, because you give us important uh, tools to have mm -hmm. this heterotopia, not utopia, but heterotopia of democracy in order to be able to think beyond mm -hmm. capitalism, I think, please put the uh, patriarchy in your <laughs> uh, research. That yeah, I, I think that's a, I, uh, I take the, the, the point, um, Obviously, I mean, for me, I, I find Federici's work very fascinating. Um, I'm not sure I believe, <laughs> I'm not sure I believe it as a theory of capitalism, but, but that's a different conversation maybe. Um, I think Nancy Fraser's work uh, on periodization of capitalism and the family is really fundamental. And I think she's m moving toward um, which is doing exactly what I said, which is periodizing capitalism in terms of obviously these different regimes of care uh, that are organized around uh, you know different different overall phases of capitalist development. Um, I I guess the only thing I can say is that I take your point that th that should be worked in in an explicit way in thinking through these different um, phases of capitalist um, development. And um, I cannot do that right now on the fly. But I appreciate you bringing that issue up. It's a very well taken point. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions uh, or observations or thoughts to share? Um, if there aren't any right now, um, should we ask some questions as well? We've got some questions for you. But we'll keep it short. Uh, I'll start and then I'll pass it over to George. Um, I was very interested by what we were saying, the transformation, transformation from hegemonic politics to status groups that you mentioned. That's my first question. And the second one is, um, if you agree 
because I don't know if you agree that there is a shift towards authoritarianism in, in recent years. You know, I would, I would agree with you that this starts with uh, the economic crisis of 2008-2009, whether, uh, whether uh, this shift towards authoritarianism is also uh, a consequence of this end of relationship between, let's say, uh, the, w it, is it a consequence of the uh, end of democratic capitalism? Um, great, thanks for those uh, questions, Rosa. Um, on the first one, um, so I don't think that this, the, the rise of status group politics is particular to the US. I think that uh, immigration and refugee politics are actually a really, really central place in which that plays out. Um, in fact, that might be the most important form of status group politics there is. I mean, citizenship is, you know, maybe the most important status group. Um, so, you know, there is, I think this is probably characterizing, I mean, you know, the, the, rise, of, the, the rise of the right in, in everywhere is really, um, to a certain extent, I think, is driven by this emergence of, Identity politics. I mean, that's where identity politics is actually most important to understand the right, I would say. Um, in, in the US, I guess there are some particular ways in which that um, uh, plays out. Um, and this idea, you know, um, I think that the US left faces certain very important challenges having to do with the political system, and particularly with the role of the court system. And, 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 you know, the whole, if you think about the gains, the progressive gains um, over the last half century, they have all been focused around court decisions. I mean, the civil rights movement, uh, Roe versus Wade, which now no longer exists, uh, for example. These are, and so there's a way in which, and I haven't fully worked this out, but there's a way in which this idea of sort of groups having rights is just really entrenched in the American political system. And I'm not sure that's broadly applicable everywhere, but I think this process of the rise of these status group politics is probably broadly uh, applicable. Um, on, yeah, on the shift to authoritarianism, yeah, I do think there's a shift to underlying, you know, until we, we address the underlying problems that are producing it. And this turn toward authoritarianism you know, I, I see it as basically beginning really with the, probably the Berlusconi phenomenon, right? That's the canary in the coal mine. Um, and, um, you know, it's, so it's, it's a very long-standing thing. It's not, um, it's not something that's, that's come out of nowhere, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that's likely to continue. Yeah. So... Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dimitra Kasimi. I, I enjoyed your talk, but I, I wanted to, I don't want to pile on on the democracy point, but it does seem like if you're going to um, go into this sort of critique of rights-based politics without thinking about a, a kind of more participatory model of, of democracy or just a range of, of what you're calling a contested, you know, concept, different, different definitions, it, it doesn't sort of make sense. I mean, to kind of to critique rights-based politics and membership and citizenship when there is, of course, this tradition of critique on the left and of identity-based politics in, in the U.S. that comes out of the 90s um, and go with Schumpeter and call it thin is, I think, to use the terms of the proceduralist perspective, right? To call it thin rather than actually acknowledge that it's a, a substantive conception of, of democracy, I think, is already to capitulate um, more than, than, you know, you might want. So that's, those were just some thoughts I was having as I was listening to the last point. And then I didn't really know why you wanted to sideline um, Rosa Luxemburg, actually, because she, she the, the passage that you put up there is a critique of, um, of Schumpeter, in a way, right? 
So I wondered whether you could fold her in or to what extent you're telling a story about democracy or not. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for those questions. Um, so I guess on the first point, I'm just gonna say my decision to do this, to go with this Schumpeterian conception is not an endorsement in any way of Schumpeter, really. It's basically what I'm, it's a methodological decision. Basically what I'm saying is, I mean, the one virtue that Schumpeter's description offers, she's at least the, the, you know, as compelling, maybe more compelling than Gramsci on certain questions about, about this democracy issue. So I agree with that. So, um, thank you for everything. Uh, the first, I have one question that is uh, the following one. Uh, that you said, you argued that in the the relationship, the peaceful relationship and the compatible relationship between capitalism and democracy was something that happened briefly, you know, for 30 years in the post-war moment. And I would like, and you argue that, you know, in the previous period, this was not a very, you know, uh, peaceful relation. Uh, I would like to tell us, I mean, what, what democracy was before and what type which features uh, it had, and uh, I mean, how this was linked uh, with the fascism. And a second question is, um, because you have write an article in, in your new introduction to the Civic Foundation Fascism, uh, that you compare, you know, the interwar fascism and the new form of right-wing authoritarianism. Uh, I would like to tell us, you know, how, uh, for example, phenomena like Trumpism and this type of stuff, I mean, uh, are linked to the, what you said, you know, political capitalism, you have, you know, uh, more specific arguments on these relationships, and uh, in which sense they differ from the interwar phenomenon of the non-democratic moment, as you argued, so. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, let me see here. So, on on the first issue, um, what I think is, I mean, I guess I would just say about this sort of capitalism and democracy relationship before Second World War. I mean, just think about the two most dynamic capitalist economies around 1900. One of them is the United States, and the other one is Germany, right? Um, uh, yeah, well, this is an, that's clearly an American faux pas. Um, so, uh, the United Kingdom is, not, is an imperial power of world-spanning scope, right? Um, the United States has a continent at its disposal, right? These are things that, you know, are just kind of exceptional, kind of almost one-off elements. To the extent that democracy does, is rooted in these, in these places, it's often an expression, obviously, of farmers and peasants more than it is the main classes of sort of industrial capitalism. So I just don't think, I think that the capitalism democracy relationship is much more contingent and problematic than I guess usually it's seen in sort of political sociology, say that. Um, in terms of the new rights and the new kind of forms of authoritarianism and Trumpism, um, Yes, I think that, the, I, you know, I would hope that this framework of political capitalism sheds a lot of light on that. Um, uh, I do think that the new, as I've said in several places, I think that the new right is quite different from the interwar right. Um, and I think it's primarily different because um, 
it's not the case that democracy in this period is being squeezed by a class conflict. It's actually being undermined from above by a completely one-sided attack. Um, and so it doesn't really have the characteristics of interwar fascism in, in, in that way. Um, I mean, there are other differences too, but I've written about those, so people can read about that. But that's, those are my basic views about those things. Thank, thank you. Well, I think we'll end it here for today. Uh, we would like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dylan, for for this honor to come and be here present and give this talk at the first session of our series of politics of liberation. I would like to remind you that we'll be back here on the 7th of October with Serafim Seferiadis and Lucia Kotronaki. Uh, and uh, this will always also be broadcasted. If you're interested, please, please register uh, on our website. And yeah, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again in three weeks' time. Thank you. Thanks for the question.